Uh, so would modern science place Neanderthals, maybe the beginning of them, somewhere around Mesopotamia? And uh, It's an yeah, open well, question, Michael. This is also very interesting. Um, if you put the origin of humanity back to the last common ancestor of Homo sapiens and Neanderthals, the name of this common ancestor is Heidelberg man or Homo heidelbergensis. And Homo heidelbergensis was a truly cosmopolitan species in Africa, in Asia, in Europe, so that he could have originated anywhere. It would be quite huh. consistent to say that Homo heidelbergensis or Heidelberg man uh, lived in the Middle East and that he then migrated to Europe and down south into Africa where the southern population became Homo sapiens and the northern population became Neanderthals. So I'm interested in, in the, the kind of how this affects the Imago Dei. I'm curious ah. what your thoughts are. Have, have we, in a sense, evolved out of an ectoplasmic whatever into something that's, uh, uh, you know, monkey into Homo sapien into, or is uh, Neanderthals, all, all, all humanoid kind of beings, uh, created independently of creation? Uh, how, how does this affect the Imago Dei, I, the way I that we're, just, we're looking at this? I just finished the chapter in my book on the historical Adam dealing with this question, and I think that my identification of Adam as belonging to Homo heidelbergensis implies that Neanderthals and Homo sapiens alike are created in the image of God. Okay. And are therefore people for whom Christ died. Mm -hmm. So I believe that we may well see Neanderthals in heaven among the this risen is be saints fascinating. when we go there. <laughs> exactly. Uh, and when you look at the morphological or facial features of Heidelberg man and Neanderthal, well, as one paleoanthropologist has said, if you were to dress them up in a three piece suit, uh, and have him walk into a New York subway, he would not have aroused any just, sort of special interest. And, and I don't think that's a commentary just on the indifference of New Yorkers. Uh, that make a good but, Geico commercial. <laughs> <laughs> that these folks are within what we would say are, are uh, anatomically similar human beings. Okay, so Imago Dei, the, the image of God then, in your mind, doesn't necessarily have so much to do with what shape was your skull, right. and more to do with our vocation before God, which no, is to rule the earth. No, I, thank you okay. for raising that, Michael. I reject the vocational interpretation okay. of the image of God. I think this is almost demonstrably wrong, and I discuss Richard Middleton's work in my uh, book, I would argue that the image of God has to do with some sort of substantial or ontological resemblance of human beings to God. Obviously not a physical resemblance, as you say, but rather a resemblance to God in that like God, we are persons. That is to say, we are rational, self-conscious, free individuals who are able to make morally significant choices. And even the vocational interpretation presupposes such an ontological resemblance, because in order to carry out the vocation of being God's representatives and royal um, um, underlings on this planet, you would have to have the properties of personhood and personal agency. Right. Okay, so would you say that you would exclude the vocational definition of the image of God, or more just you wouldn't limit it to that? What I would say is that it is an implication of the image of God, that God has created human beings to resemble him, and that they are finite persons resembling God, and therefore capable of carrying out the divine vocation that God gave to man when he created uh, them on this planet.